It's recording. Okay, cool. I'm going to back up. So the information and opinions expressed in this website, a platform, or during our discussions or presentations, written or verbal, not intended as healthcare recommendations, medical advice um, by the cancer patient lab, its principals, presenters, participants, or representatives. Um, you know, please consult your doctor. Also remember that this is a recorded session and will be made publicly available. If you don't want uh, to participate, you can exit now. You can change your name. Uh, you can sign off, turn off your camera, uh, block your name or identify as anonymous or uh, somebody else if you want. <laughs> um, and you can, of course, just listen. So with that, I welcome Dennis and I welcome all who are participating. I know that we'll have a lively conversation and uh, I will turn the floor over to Dennis for a presentation followed by Q&A. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you very much, Brian. And uh, I, I want to um, I want to start by thanking thanking you and and Brad for inviting us to uh, to this opportunity today. I actually have Rob Kimmerling and Mark Stevens on the call with me as well. You might see them on the on the screen there. Uh, Rob and Mark are uh, Rob is our chief technical officer, and Mark is our vice president of clinical development. And these are two of the gentlemen that were actually in the the lab at MIT where this technology was developed, and we're very lucky to have them on our team. So they'll be here today for any questions that I'm unable to answer. Um, but I'm going to go through a, a handful of slides, nothing nothing too incredibly deep, uh, and just share what our technology is, what's unique about it, and what data sort of supports it as of today. Um, and then I'll also take a, a few slides to sort of walk through, as a patient, how might you get access to our to our assay. So the first thing I'm going to start with is, uh, if I can get my thing to work, there it goes, is something that that Brian kind of already set up a little bit, uh, as did as did Brad before he dropped off. But you know, there's a real challenge with finding the right drug. In, in cancer treatment. Um, and this is even more true in later stage disease and in rare diseases. And the reality is, is that the current solution, as we spoke to just a couple minutes ago, is NCC and guidelines. And for early stage, for newly diagnosed, this is a pretty effective approach. Um, you know, the likelihood of finding an effective therapy for first line early stage disease is relatively high in most cancers and most tumor types. But once you get to recurrent disease, once you get to second or third lines of therapy, the statistical likelihood of finding a drug that creates a clinical response is about 20% at best. And it actually drops from there depending on what specific disease you might be dealing with and what challenges you're facing. The reality is, though, that there are a lot of drugs available. Um, there are hundreds of drugs listed in the NCCN guidelines, and the statistical likelihood that there's a drug in there that's going to create a clinical response in a, in a you know particular case is probably a lot better than 20%. But it's it's the the guesswork that we go through of trying to match the patient to the drug. Uh, that is the real challenge. And, um, you know, I often share that I watched my mother-in-law go through this with, uh, with late stage ovarian cancer and just the toll of trying this next therapy. Uh, let's see what happens. It, it's, it's an educated guess as to what we're going to do next in you. And it's not only physically demanding and exhausting to go through these extra additional lines of therapy, but it's emotionally exhausting too. And I know with her, she just got to a point that she was like, I'm good. Like I'm done. Right. Um, and so the idea of Trevera is to help close that gap and it's to identify these drugs that are FDA indicated that are appropriate, uh, you know, appropriately used drugs. And narrowing the list of drugs that are most likely or have a higher likelihood of eliciting a clinical response in a specific patient. And so it's truly personalized therapy. And, and I, I stress the word truly there because not all diagnostic assays we do are truly personalized. Um, I've spent 15 years of my career 
and genetics and genomics and cancer and uh, and mostly in the breast cancer and, and, and gynecologic cancer spaces. And we loved to use the word personalized. But the reality is, is it's really just smaller populations. If you're talking about a BRCA mutation, you're just part of a smaller population than you were before. That still isn't truly personalized therapy. What we're doing here at Trevera is in of one kind of work. And it really does separate it, separate it at that level. So Can we um, ask questions? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Can you go back a slide, please? Sure. Are you, <clears throat> in your improved solution, are you testing uh, single agents only? Uh, both. Uh, most of what we do are single agents, and I'll, I will get into that a little deeper. Um, but But we do do some combinations as well. Thanks. Yeah. So the idea uh, of what we're doing is not really new. Um, it, you know, the idea of ex vivo drug testing, it actually comes from the infectious disease space originally. Um, looking at, you know, unusual infections, your infectious disease doc doesn't go to their version of the NCC and guidelines. They take a biopsy, they culture those cells, they try 15 different antibiotics and they give you what works. And it's wildly effective. Um, and it's it's done every day across the US and it's kind of the standard of care in, in complicated infections. And we've been trying this same approach in cancer since the 1950s. And there are a lot of companies that have gone by the wayside over the years trying to make this happen. Um, unfortunately, we've not had really consistently sustained success in ex vivo drug testing <clears throat> approaches and one of the reasons that um, that we believe this to be true is because when you take a cancer outside of the uh, a cell out of the body, away from its life source, it dies. It dies pretty quickly on its own within a couple of days. Um, but the average cancer therapy takes about a week to work. And so you have this really challenging conundrum in time management of removing the cells and measuring a drug's ability to kill a cell when the drug is dying faster than the cell than the or when the cell is dying faster than the drug can kill it. So we've had to intervene. And this has been the typical approach. It's been cultures, it's been PDX, it's been, you know, more recently the organoid approach. Um, and we're we're improving the ways in which we do this over over time. But the challenge that remains pretty consistent is that the biology over time inevitably changes. There's there's lots of published data on this. We see phenotypic drift in these cells. We see genotypic drift in these cells. We grow up the wrong subclonal population because of heterogeneity and 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 sample, you know, sample. Uh, picking and et cetera. And so, you know, we end up testing drug against something that isn't necessarily representative of what was taken out of the patient. And this has been the inherent challenge with ex vivo drug testing. What we do differently here at Trevera is we have figured out how to kind of work that clock backwards. Rather than figuring out how to keep the cells alive long enough to measure their ability to kill cells, or the, the drug's ability to kill the cells, we have figured out how to measure the drug's impact on the cells so fast that we don't have to do anything to keep them alive. And so this is the first ex vivo drug test that's clinically available, to my knowledge, in 70 plus years of research in this area that is actually testing drug response in the patient's direct cells rather than a grown version of those cells. And that is a really important paradigm shift in the way that we're approaching this. So this is how it works. It actually is because of uh, because of an invention called the SMR, uh, the suspended microchannel resonator, which is a, a physics device that was developed at uh, a physics lab at MIT. And this is a tiny little MEMS chip, which if you're not familiar with MEMS, it's I, I always just describe it as a microchip that has physical movement instead of circuits. And Idea, what the idea here is, is you see this, this tiny little chip on the finger here. These are fluidics channels. And we get a live cancer cell specimen 
And I'll go through the exact process in just a moment of how that works. But but we get a live cancer cell specimen, we expose it to drug, and we pass it through a single cell suspension over, over this chip. And as you can see, as it passes through here, it goes over this thing that looks like a diving board, this cantilever. And it, it takes advantage of a really simple law of physics that says the resonant frequency of an oscillating cantilever is directly proportional to its mass. What that means is when you jump off of a diving board, you get that vibration after you jump, that vibration changes based on how much you weigh. And that vibration, if you can measure the actual frequency of it, is accurate to about 10 parts in a billion. It's an incredibly accurate measurement tool. And so what that means is we can measure the mass of an individual cell that's about 100 times more precise than any other measurement technology available in the world today. I always like to give this one little example. It gets a little deep, so bear with me. But we can recognize the change in mass of a cell that would be equivalent to that cell losing about five nanometers of diameter. Now, if any of you had freshman year physics classes in high school, you might remember that a single wavelength of visible light is between 400 and 700 nanometers. And we can measure you know, mass change down to about a five nanometer loss. So it's 100 times smaller than, than a wave of light. The reason that specific example is really important is because the next best technology available today to weigh individual cells is a light microscope but light can never be better than 400 nanometers. And so it's just this incredibly precise measurement tool and measurement tools change science, right? The microscope, X-ray, MRI, new measurement tools create opportunities to do things that we thought were previously impossible. And that's really what this has done. And so the, the team at MIT, including the, the gentleman on the phone, on the, uh, on the call here, um, took this down the street to Dana-Farber and played off of a really simple, you know, concept of biology, which was, we know that when a cell, really any cell, dies, on average, it loses about half of its mass. And we know that when a cancer cell is responding to an effective cancer therapy, that death process takes an average of about a week. So the question was, might a cancer cell responding to an effective drug change its mass by a small amount in the first few hours or the first day? And the answer to that question has kind of been a resounding yes. Um, I don't use this phrase lightly, but this is almost a universal biomarker. We've shown that this works across virtually all carcinomas, um, many of the blood cancers, and it works with just about every mechanism of action of drug you can think of. It's incredibly broad because at the end of the day, if the drug is going to affect the cell and eventually kill the cell, it's going to change the cell. And when the cell changes, it's mass changes. If you can measure the mass change to enough specificity. And so that's really where this comes in. So the concept in, in practice works like this. Uh, we get a live cell specimen, and I'm going to go through the actual steps of kind of what would be involved as a patient in just a minute. But, you know, either a malignant fluid collection, if you have ascites or a pleural effusion, that's a really easy specimen for us to work from. Uh, it works great on our platform. It's, it's probably our preference, um, but we also can work from solid tissue, from core biopsies, from uh, fine needle aspiration, and from excisional or resections. Uh, we work with a lot of patients with, with uh, peritoneal disease, for example, that are having diagnostic laparoscopies, and those are really nice ways to get a nice tissue specimen. We don't need a lot, but we provide our test kit ahead of time. Specimen is collected and placed into our kit, cold shipped overnight, FedEx to us in our lab. We isolate out the cancer cells. And we separate them out into a 96 well plate in, in the lab. So about 5,000 cancer cells per well. And then we put drug in some of those wells and we leave others as controls. We incubate that for 24 hours. And then we go back and we run our, our measurements. So 
Um, and the example you see on the screen here, you've got the blue cup would have 5,000 cancer cells and, and, and an appropriate dose of drug for that amount of cell. And then on the, in the gray cup, you've got 5,000 cancer cells that are just sitting there with nothing. Um, nothing really added to them. It's all about minimal change from what they were taken, you know, taken out of the patient as incubate for 24 hours. And then we take 5,000 individual measurements. We measure every single cell in that cup. And from those 5,000 individual measurements, we build these little mass diagrams that sort of give a distribution of all of the different weights represented in that specimen. The goal being, if the cells in the control and the cells in the drug are changing at the same rate, and those two curves overlap uh, or sort of mirror each other, that drug was basically a placebo. It's done nothing in these cells. But if there is a shift in the distribution of measurement from the one sample to the control, like you see on the screen, that's what tells us that this drug is beginning to take effect and you know, four or five days from now should kill these cells. So it all sounds really cool and interesting in, in a laboratory application, but how does it translate to outcomes? Um, so far, uh, we've done several hundred uh, of these tests, but we have full clinical outcomes on about 60. Uh, and this is spread across a lot of different tumor types, um, as you'll see on the screen here. But the predictive accuracy of the assay right now is sitting at about 85%, which we're incredibly proud of. Um, it's a, it's a great number, but is a, it is a small N. So, you know, we're continuing to look for opportunities to further our validation, our research and, and our partnerships. And, and I'll share in a minute again about how you can actually get it, if it makes sense for you in your case. Um, but two points I want to make on this. We have both positive predictive value here and negative predictive value, um, both sitting in the 80% plus range. What that means is, these are patients that received our test. We ran a, a panel of 20 drugs. Two days later, they get the results back and they went on one of the drugs we ran. Positive predictive value means that patient went on a drug that we said was going to work. And then some months later, we got clinical outcomes data from their physician as to whether or not they had a, you know, a clinical response from that drug. And when they did, that was an accurate call. So these are patients that got a drug we said was going to work, and the drug created a, a clinical response. Negative predictions are patients that got a drug we said was not going to work, and those patients continued to progress on that drug. And so those are the, the sort of differences between negative and, negative and positive predictive value. It's an important definition to understand because when we're running a list of 20 drugs, there often are drugs we say are going to work. And there are also a lot of the drugs that we say aren't going to work. And so there's the opportunity to not only rule in drugs that might have a higher likelihood of response, but there's also potentially the opportunity to rule out drugs that are unlikely to elicit a response. This is the panel of, of tumor types, uh, cancer types, and, and uh, drugs that we can do. Um, I haven't mentioned it yet, but we also do do the immunotherapies. We have a checkpoint inhibitor panel. Um, for those of you that understand how checkpoint inhibitors work, often I get the question, how are you measuring cancer cell response to checkpoint inhibitors? And we're not. Uh, we're actually measuring immune cell response to the checkpoint inhibitors. So we can't do that from tissue. We can only right now, because we can't get enough immune cells out of the tissue, we're only doing that test right now from malignant fluids. So when you have ascites or pleural effusions, there tend to be a lot of immune cells and, and ideally tumor activated immune cells in that, in that fluid. And so we're separating out those T cells and we're actually measuring the ability for the checkpoint inhibitors to activate those immune cells. So that is a, that's a sort of a separate test that we do. The technology, the process is the same. We're just measuring the cell response of the T cell rather than the cancer cell. Um, we do basically build 20 drug standard panels depending on what the diagnosis is. And then we work with the doctor and the patient to edit and adjust that, you know, on a case-by-case on -case basis as it makes sense. The other thing that becomes really important is that we're not always able to get enough cells to run all 20 drugs. And so we also work with the patient and the doctor to prioritize the list. Because if I, can only, if I only have enough cells to run five drugs, 
I don't want to run five drugs that you already had and don't care about, right? Um, and so we we work with not only what drugs are on the list, but what priority is important to you in your in your care as well. Uh, we're specifically focused on while well, we've got a wide list of cancers we can do here, and we'll we'll still take any and all of that. Um, we're obviously focused on building our data. And so we're specifically targeting right now GI, gynecologic, and lung-based malignancies is, is what we're really very interested in building out our data set in. But um, but as I said, we're doing a lot of other stuff. And, uh, you know, I, I know that there are definitely some patients in this community I've spoken with with pancreatic cancer. We kind of put that in the GI bucket. Um, anything that that is in that peritoneal cavity that GI, you know, the GI and, onco and, and gynecologic sort of malignancies. So this is how it works. And, and I'll give you guys just a, a this will just be a, a quick review, but kind of who qualifies for this. The first thing to be aware of is the timing of it. Um, when should I get this specimen, you know, this test done? Uh, it's really at a point that you're planning to change therapy. If you're on a therapy that's working, the likelihood is even if you've got a biopsy and you send us that specimen, uh, there's a decent chance that we're going to get a specimen full of dead cells because th the drug you're taking is working. Um, and, you know, I'm I'm always of the uh, of the mindset that let's not break what's what's not broken. Right. So um, the idea really is to get this at a time that you're looking to make change. Also, as I kind of alluded to earlier, and as you all well know, cancer is a mutant by definition, and cancer changes over time. And so it changes in response to environmental factors and, and different drugs and treatments you've been exposed to and just over time in general. And so having this test done today, if you're not planning to go on therapy for the next year, might not be as valuable as it would be if you were getting it done right before you initiated therapy. You wanna catch this cancer in these cells and kind of the most real-time way that you can to make sure that what we're delivering is, is as specific to your current case as it possibly could be. So um, and, you know, you know, the other point here is that uh, it can make sense to do the test more than once. Um, if you have therapy, you, you, know, you maybe use this test to guide therapy, and then at some point in the future, there's a recurrence it absolutely makes it might make sense to test again before you know with that recurrence because you know again this could be a recurrence where the cells have changed from the original specimen and and there might be different drugs identified uh we need live cancer cells so this is probably the most significant challenge that we face in this test live cell testing is hard uh, and, you know, and a lot of it is is about timing. So getting the word out, letting people know that this exists and that it's available. Brian opened up the call with, I might be giving you a call in six months. Um, that's exactly the way to be thinking about this. If it doesn't apply to you today, now you know that it exists and it might apply to you later. Um, but because the test is not reimbursed by insurance right now, and by the way, we're going to give it to you for free, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But because it's not reimbursed by insurance right now, if you were to get a biopsy ordered specifically for this test, the biopsy isn't going to be covered by insurance either. Insurance companies don't like to pay for biopsies for tests that they don't pay for. So we typically just piggyback on existing procedures. Like I said, if you have ascites or a pleural effusion, you're commonly getting that drained at regular intervals. So it's a really easy point for us to get a specimen. It's easy to work with. It's, it's, it's all the things. Um, but when it comes to the, the biopsies or the surgical procedures, we just have to be conscious of the timing around that. And I'll work with you closely to kind of work through that process as much as I can. Um, the, uh, the third thing, and I've kind of already spoken to those, so I apologize for not clicking my button. Um, is that it, it, we are a CLIA a pr approved assay, and that does mean we need a physician's order. This is not something that a patient can order themselves. Uh, so we do need your doctor's support. Um, we do have a network of doctors that we can connect you to if that's something that, that makes sense to you or that you're interested in. And we're always looking to expand that network. 
That said, my success rate in getting doctors to order this test is pretty high. Um, we've done, you know, approaching, I, I've had contacts with, with somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 patients in the last year. Um, we've tested more than 200 of them. Most of the ones we haven't tested have been patients that didn't have tissue or biopsy of you know, or fluid available at this time, or they're putting it off for something in the future, et cetera. Um, the vast majority of doctors that I actually talked to in those 200 plus cases ended up being willing to order the test. And, um, I, you know, in fact, I think we've only had about, it, it's fewer than 10 doctors that have flat out said, I won't do this. Now, what they do with the results when they get them, if it says something that they don't want it to say, is probably another discussion. But the willingness to order the test, we're, we're able to work through, and, uh, and we always will work with our patients as directly as we can. I even go as far as to, as to provide a draft email that you can just make a couple of little edits to, to send to your doctor to kind of say, hey, I've learned about this thing, I want it, and this is why I want it. So the process, as I said, is once you know you've got a procedure coming up, we provide the kit ahead of time. So we need some notice, uh, but you know we can't overnight it if we need to, but generally at least two days notice is ideal, really ideally more than that. Once we provide the kit, we coordinate with you, your oncologist, your surgeon, your interventional radiologist, whomever it is. Um, they put the specimen into the kit, they ship it overnight to us. As I said, we get it in our lab, we run our process up to 20 drugs plus those four immunotherapies if it's if it's an immune i mean if it's a fluid specimen that produces enough immune cells um and then the basically the day after that we return results to your doc so if you were to get a biopsy on a monday morning we're returning results to your doctor with uh, analysis of those 20 drugs usually by the end of the day wednesday or thursday morning um the entire process only takes a couple of days once we get the specimen and it's, uh, there's a lot of value in that when you're trying to make quick, quick clinical decisions. Um, but it's also just an inherent feature of our assay. As I said, we're not doing anything to keep your cells alive. We're really minimally interfering with the cells. And so we have to work quickly because we don't want to mess with the cells. We want them as similar to what they were when they came out of your body as they possibly can be. The report looks like this. We stack rank the drugs uh, on a scale of zero to 100, and we, we list out, you know, what is where, um, 100 being the highest likelihood of, of eliciting a response or seeing a response in our hands, um, down to zero, meaning that we really saw no response from these cells in our hands. We actually plot them, since this is a mass change assay, uh, we actually plot the mass change on a chart as well. Some, some people like to see that. Um, and then as you, as you see, this is a pretty typical report. We usually will get a, a handful of drugs, five or six that are up at the top that are highly sensitive. And then we'll get a lot at the bottom and there might be a few that are sitting somewhere in the middle. But this line here at 50 is kind of the line that we've drawn to almost make this a binary assay in that the stuff above a score of 50 um, has, a, has a statistically significant P value, meaning that we're highly confident that the, that the response we saw in these cells in our hands was due to the drug and not some other variable, right? And so that's kind of how that works. But really anything with a score above 50 has a, has a much higher likelihood of eliciting a clinical response and vice versa. And then there will, you know, there are always inevitably a couple that sort of sit somewhere in the middle and the real thing with these drugs that would sit in the middle is just the confidence level of, uh, of what was creating that change is just not as high. So what do you do as a patient? Um, if you want this, as I said, we're, we're offering this through groups like Cancer Patient Lab at no cost. Um, we're still doing clinical trials. We're working with a clinical trial with X-Cures. I'm sure a lot of you are probably familiar with, with X-Cures and, and Cancer Commons. Um, and I can show you guys how to enroll in that. For doctors that are a little more skeptical or hesitant to do the test through just kind of the free early access program, the X-Cures study 
just gives a little bit of protection and uh, it, it gives something that the doctors feel more comfortable about if it's part of a clinical trial. They're, you know, they're often likely to do it that way. Um, it also helps us with collecting the follow-up data and the outcomes, which is really what we're looking for. So, um, you know, I say that we're given the test at no cost. The only ask that we have is that you let us know what happens. We're looking for real world case experience. And so we want to know, did you end up going on one of these drugs? And if so, what kind of a response did you see? Um, and we actually collect that data through like a 15 question HIPAA compliance survey that I send a few months after the test is done. And then occasionally following that, we might follow up and say, hey, is it possible for you to get us a, you know, a, a screenshot of these notes from from your, you know, from your my chart or something along those lines, just anything that we can get to sort of create a little bit of validation data that we can fit into our real world evidence portfolio for, you know, future reimbursement. But basically, the process is that you contact me, and uh, I'm going to put my contact information on the, the last screen here in just a minute. Um, but you reach out to me, I'll walk you through the whole process beginning to end. Every patient that comes through our lab comes through me as well. And so, um, like I said, working with you to connect to your doctor, to communicate with your doctor, to get the order filled out, to get the test kit out, et cetera. It all works through me and all you really have to do is contact me directly to make that happen. And, and I'll, I'll kind of walk you through, help you figure out if you're qualified. Um, if you have questions, I'm happy to do all of that. Um, you know, logistics, like I said already, the, uh, the biggest challenge is just timing with any scheduled biopsies and or, and or fluid drains. Um, I had a patient, actually a nurse called me yesterday morning at 8 a.m. and was like, hey, our patient's having a biopsy at 11. What do we do? I'm like, nothing. Sorry. I, <laughs> I wish I could help, but, but um, just, you know, we, we need a little more lead time than that. Um, potential risks. Obviously, anytime you're having a, a procedure done, a biopsy, a fluid drain, whatever it is, there are risks associated with that. Um, those really are the most significant risks associated with running this test. You know, we're we're running a list of drugs that in the vast majority of cases are kind of already in the purview of you or the doctor, already drugs that you're considering. All we're doing is giving some additional information and guidance on whether or not those drugs elicited a response in our hands. And um, and so the biggest risk really is probably associated with the procedures themselves. Um the second, the second risk to be aware of is that, you know, this is new. As I said, the data looks really good. 85% predictive value is, is an impressive number. And we're seeing it hold true as we add patients to that data set. But the, the N is small. And, you know, it's the reason we're willing to run the test at no cost in, in exchange for letting us know what happens is because we know that we need more cases. We need more experience. We need more data. And there are just things that we don't yet know. And then finally, and I, I spoke to this a little bit earlier, uh, the, the other risk is that it just might not work. Um, we got a really well-collected specimen yesterday or earlier this week from an interventional radiologist that has been great, works really closely with us. He called to make sure there wasn't anything he could have done better. It was just kind of a white marbled specimen, really fibrous. There were like 500 cells or something. Um, there just weren't any cancer cells in the specimen. And sometimes we just aren't able to get what we need. Um, the majority of cases work. And Rob and, and, and Mark and, and the team in our lab have done an amazing job of improving this accurate or this the success rate over time. As we get more cases, we've we've upgraded our, our process and how we isolate the cells and, and how we get rid of all of the background cells, et cetera. And so we're getting better and better at this all the time. But there are still some specimens that will just fail. And uh, this is the flow. So as I said, this is there's nothing new here. This is just kind of what I already said. You let me know you're interested. I work with you to get your doc in, engaged and, and to order the test or a doc. Um, you get your cell specimen collection. They put it into our kit, ship it to us. We'll run up to 20 therapy drugs and, and uh, immunotherapies. Return the report a couple of days later. 
And then at some future date, we we ask for your feedback. Um, this is the XCurious trial. I can actually just give you guys the, the direct link. There's a, there's a landing page or you can email me. Um, and here's my contact information. So I am going to stop. I know we've got a, a lot of things in the chat. And um, is it Syed? Yeah, uh, Dennis, uh, thank you. I really appreciate it. It was an awesome, <clears throat> awesome overview. You covered a lot of ground uh, pretty quickly. And uh, so if you have any questions, um, please raise your hand uh, using the Zoom uh, functionality and I'll call on you. Uh, Saeed, if you're, uh, I know you do have a question or at least a thought. If you have any questions, please um, please uh, chime in now or uh, raise your hand. Hear me, right? Yes, I uh, yeah. hear yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, sorry, I got blue and if you could, but uh, after watching this presentation, I feel much better. For the last 12 years, I've been analyzing hundreds of thousands of the on the state. Just let you know, we have more than 5 million samples free of charge on the public domain. Uh, your method easily make uh, a head higher than the other method. I just want to say congratulations. You are you are on the right track. For sure, there is many things you need to resolve, but you are on the right track. And I strongly suggest everybody, our friends on this call, uh, they try this method. And this is one. And now my question. First is uh, the problem of heterogeneity of the cancer cell. How do you manage that? Uh, yeah, great question. So, um, you know, heterogeneity is always an issue, right, with with anything that you do. Uh, but I think we've we've got sort of an interesting solution that was unintentional in the way our assay works, and that we work from a single cell suspension. Um, and so, you know, we we get that biopsy or we get that fluid specimen. The first thing we do is is you know, lice the background cells, get down to the cancer cells through through existing technologies that we didn't that we didn't develop, um, and we get that single specimen down to a um, a single cell suspension that is then divided into you know the five thousand cells per well, and so you end up almost like tossing everything into a blender, right? And, and <laughs> in, a, in a really layman way to put it. And so we end up having a nice control for heterogeneity just built into our natural processing. Um, now, what we can't control- oh, It means or, you mix them, mix them together? You just- it, Yes, yeah, yeah, we I do. Can, there is a challenge for this one, but uh, it's okay. You're going to solve it in the future because I can show you the importance of single step. But but that's that's the when you are on the right track you can resolve. Uh, yeah, I have and, more question, but I'm gonna wait for them at the Thank you. And, Thank and, you, Saeed. Uh, Rob I, and I, Mark, uh, if you're both still on, if if uh, if if there's anything that you have to add to anything that I say, please do. Yeah, so actually just one quick point on the heterogeneity uh, to the, the point of whether or not all of the cells are responding in a population of a mixed population of cells. That's a question that we're not really parsing with these single cell readouts. We don't know which are the responsive and non-responsive cells. Instead, what we do is we take that population of single cells, and if we see a big difference uh, after 24 hours, we assume that the drug is affecting a large enough fraction of the sort of clones in that population to induce a response. And then the idea there is, if there are resistant clones in that population of a tumor, if those come back, uh, this test can still be used for that follow-up in the next case, find the next yeah. drug that might once again affect a large fraction of those clones. So that sort of iterative process is another way to get at the, the heterogeneity problem that you mentioned. And that's why I'm the BD guy and not the CTO. Yeah. Rob's yeah. answer was much but better than mine. Future, future belongs to single cell. As I said, your method is the right method. It means it's going to get improved and it's a, you have a bright future. There is no guarantee, but based on my many years of experience in this field, I've never, I say, if I give A to the only method I've seen so far is your method. Good Thank you, Saeed, for your question and your, your comments. Um, I, I share those sentiments. Uh, I'm going to move on to um, uh, Gitta. Uh, so Gitta Peterson, um, you have your hand raised. 
Correct. Um, uh, first of all, I, I'm uh, on the same side as uh, Said. This is really interesting. Um, we have um, uh, what we do is to analyze RNA and create uh, hypothesis based on overexpressed targets for drugs that are already approved uh, outside of standard of care. So not necessarily uh, looking at um, uh, or lim not, in no way limited to uh, the standard recipe that doesn't work for most. So we are completely aligned. Um, we don't have uh, what you do, which is the functional piece um, and could imagine that um, some of these hypotheses you're talking about doing a clinical study that we would like to validate if possible, and that's a Rob here, we can get access to um, live uh, tumor cells. Um, and I will follow up with you directly on that. I do have a question though. Um, I, I think it was partly answered um, it's not the heterogeneity question, really. It's you, you're separating the tumor cells from the tissue. Is, is that correctly understood? And if that is correctly understood, um, how do you make sure you don't have uh, normal tissue in the mix? And how's that done? Yeah, so Dennis, I can, I can uh, speak to sort of the purification on our end. So you're absolutely right. We really want to measure the tumor cells in isolation. We want to see specifically the drug effect on those tumor cells. Uh, so we do use commercial kits that essentially allow us to pull out all of the background cells we're not interested in. So this gets rid of some of the stromal cells, the immune cells. Uh, we can use lysis to get rid of red blood cells. But then mm. after that, part of our CLIA workflow is actually to verify the purity of the sample we're working with for uh, drug plating. And we do this with uh, surface markers. So we work primarily with carcinomas. So we'll do flow cytometry for EPCAM. This is a, just an epithelial marker. And we're in the process of bringing mm. in a, another uh, flow cytometry panel to just further verify the purity. Um, and it's exactly to that point to just make sure that what we're yeah. measuring is actually the tumor cell population that we're interested in. Uh, and that's part of the QC workflow for our CLIA pipeline. Uh, if we don't have yeah. a high enough purity, we actually can't proceed with, with the drug testing. So that, that's definitely okay. something that's important on our end. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Gita. Uh, Alexis, you have your hand raised. I do. Thanks so much. A great presentation. Uh, I, had, I had a similar question about that. Um, you've already addressed part of it with that explanation about how you remove normal cells, because part of it was if you're looking at a heterogeneous population, um, maybe you have normal cells as part of your control. So I was a little curious about what your internal control was. And then are these done in replicates? Uh, just because that's usually a standard practice when you're doing a 96 well play, you usually have replicates, especially when you're applying one drug per well. Is that what's done? Yeah, so actually for the plating approach we use, we use uh, vehicle-treated control cells as the, the reference population. So these are cells that are just treated with effectively no drug, and that's what is incubated for the same amount of time as drug. And then those two reference populations are compared for the sort of uh, statistical readout. In terms of the plating replicates, we actually found we historically had done triplicate measurements for all of these. Um, and we did a, quite a bit of validation where it turns out because we're measuring 5,000 cells from each of these populations, the single replicate actually does a, a really good job of capturing that, that uh, response each time. So after verifying that, we actually have now chosen to prioritize measuring a larger drug panel when we can. So we still do need 5,000 cells per condition, but rather than measuring those in triplicate, we're trying to get more of a, a broader drug panel for a fixed number of cells. So it's a great question. Um, it's something we actually published last year, that sort of validation data set that shows the replicates are, are very consistent with each other. And that's the reason we started to prioritize more conditions and just get a bit more data on that front. Great answer. And thank you. May I ask just one follow on question? Um, have you done the comparison between uh, har cells harvested from the fluid versus a solid tumor when you're able to have both? Have you done that comparison? We have. We've had a handful of cases where we have, uh, for example, an abdominal ascites at the same time as a peritoneal uh, solid mass. And what, what's interesting is we don't always see the exact same results in terms of drug response. So we'll see for a 20 drug panel, there might be a couple of drugs that are discordant between the tissue and the fluid. 
Um, I don't think we have enough data to say whether or not that's that's truly biologically related. It might be the fact that the cells in the fluid are in fact have a different sensitivity profile. We don't really have enough data to comment on that, but we do have a couple of those paired samples that show pretty interesting concordance a lot of the time, but also a few drugs that don't always agree, which is just biologically interesting, essentially. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, Rick, you have your hand raised. Yeah, hi. Yeah, terrific uh, talk. Really appreciate it. Uh, curious, uh, you know, especially with Gitta on the phone, um, is there any correlation of results with um, genomics and transcript transcriptomics? Yeah, so th this is another case where we do have a handful of specimens we've run that we, we know the, the reference genomic panel for them, either by Foundation or Tempest. Um, and what's interesting is that, again, those aren't always concordant. We actually view this as a pretty big strength of the platform that we're working with, is that we're not relying on the genomic panel and assuming a sort of biological response. We're just measuring the cells and seeing if there, there's a response. And so what we found is we've seen cases where there's confirmed a mutation that the sample does not respond to drug, and that turned out to be true for that patient, unfortunately. Uh, we've also had cases where we saw that there was resistance to a confirmed mutation, but again, that patient didn't see a response. And so that there's a mix between them. I think what we do have a, a fair amount of information for now is that it, it doesn't always overlap with the information you would get from genomics or transcriptomics, um, which from our perspective, we feel like that's what we're excited about. We're offering a bit more information uh, to layer on top of those existing clinical readouts. I think the other thing that's important to add to that, Rick, too, is that, um, it, you know, most drugs are marketed as something, right? An EGFR inhibitor, uh, for example. And in reality, it's really common that those drugs hit more than one target. And so, you know, there's plenty of reason to believe in some of the data that we've seen, uh, you know, just because somebody doesn't have an EGFR inhibitor, as an example, doesn't mean that they might not be responsive to one of those drugs that are maybe hitting that pathway, but maybe hitting some other pathways as well. Um, the other thing that I, I believe is really important is that, you know, I, I've been in the oncology space for, for, you know, the better part of 15 years. And the general consensus uh, among oncologists with the checkpoint inhibitors, with a lot of other targeted drugs is if, if, you know, if one checkpoint inhibitor doesn't work, then probably none of them will. And if one EGFR inhibitor doesn't work, then probably none of them will. Um, but the reality is, is that's not necessarily the case, right? I mean, we show differential responses. We get lung patients that, you know, there's seven different EGFR inhibitors approved on the market. What if you just picked the wrong one, doc, right? Um, every molecule is different and every patient processes every molecule in different ways. And so, you know, finding a right drug among a class can be a, a really valuable thing that is maybe often overlooked. Yeah, great. I, point. I, I have a complimentary question. So, Rick, maybe if I could just chime in there. Um, what about uh, proteomics and, and even spatial phenotyping, where you're getting at a single cell view um, with spatial, spatial phenotyping? Are you seeing any correlation to, to that, or are you even looking at spatial phenotyping or proteomics? Yeah, so for our our side, I think the only real comparator we have that's semi-spatial would be the, the PDL1 readouts for some of the checkpoint uh, histology that, that's done. We really don't do much on the spatial side, mostly because as Dennis mentioned before, we're dissociating these tissues down, we're breaking it down to a single cell suspension and running it in a fluid through our machine. So we kind of lose that spatial context. Um, mm -hmm. So the real the main reference point we do have is for the, the PDL1. We, we have found uh, that again, for our checkpoint readout, there's not always a, a correlation with that sort of spatial PDL1 readout from a histology slide for that mass. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have a huge amount of data on that front, though, to be fair. So that, that comparison isn't very deep, but that's the main reference point we have so far with some of the work we're doing. Okay. And I, I noticed that Al, that Rick had a, another question in the chat yeah. about ptDNA um, uh, liquid biopsy, right? I. Uh, that is probably not in the in the near future for us. Uh, the, you know, the number of cells, as we kind of spoke to, we need about 100,000 cancer cells to run a full panel. The volume of blood you would need to get 100,000 cancer cells out of a blood specimen is um, you would you would 
you would die of blood loss. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it loses its value at that point. Um, now that said, uh, we do have early research happening. Um, this isn't available in our CLIA pipeline, but we, we are looking down research roads of this. Um, Rob has absolutely done work with, with the immune checkpoint panel uh, and getting immune cells from peripheral blood. And so there, that does show some promise, uh, but being able to get enough cancer cells from the blood to do what we're doing right now isn't, isn't at least in the near term, not realistic. Okay. Yeah. Have you had any success with uh, uh, cancer in the bone, which would be me? Um, you know, my prostate cancer is spread to my bone. Uh, is that something that can work? So we've had um, only a handful of sort of bone biopsies that we've tried. They tend to be really difficult to dissociate just to get the single cells out of them. And it's mostly just because of the sort of physical matrix that that sample is collected in. Um, but it does depend on, on the sort of the type of mass. We've had a couple soft tissue masses within the bone um, that we've had some success with, but it really is, it's very context dependent in terms of what that mass looks like in the tissue we're able to get. Who would make that call a pathologist? Uh, typically, yeah, that, that's not something we would sort of specialize in. We don't know the sort of composition before it gets to us. Um, so I, I think typically it would be just in consultation with the oncologist and the pathologist. I think you guys are great. The reason I asked the uh, correlation of uh, results was uh, not where you are today with your low uh, sample numbers, but where uh, the hope you uh, offer for the near future. I mean, you could really change so much uh, understanding, and that's why I mentioned Gitta. Uh, this could really uh, open up a validation avenue, or you know, things that you see with transcriptomics that you may loosely think something, um, and then your uh, fantastic measurement. Um, technology can help tease apart um, the, you know answers to those tough questions so thank you so much thanks Rick uh, uh Richard Anders um hi yeah I I echo everyone else I I, I uh, met uh, Scott Manalis when he just had the resonant tuning mm -hmm. fork probably in about 2005 and I've been hearing about it for many, many years as he's been looking for applications. And, you know, my angel group meets at the Koch Institute and I've just been following this and didn't know you guys were doing this, but it's great work. Um, I also like you to have uh, questions just about sort of sample prep, just a couple, I guess, first of all, the 5,000 is not a magic number, right? It's just, you're looking for statistical robustness. So you could be 2,000, could be 3,000, as long as you get the distribution that you want and can measure the band shift, it's good enough, right? Or just want to be sure I'm not misunderstanding that. that that's absolutely right. And the main thing, we, reason we're shooting for 5,000, it's actually the sweet spots right around 2,500 clean measurements that we need. Um, but when we collect 5,000 cells, that will often lose some of those to image curation or background debris. So that's the main, the, the 2,500 number is really that sweet spot for our statistical model to make sure we can actually parse a reasonable response between them. But you're, you're absolutely right. There's, there's no magic to that number. And there's probably a quite a large heterogeneity around cells. I mean, not whether they're heterogeneous cancer cells, but just cells. I mean, cell, you know, cell size and cell mass. So you have to deconvolute that issue in your statistics as well, I assume. Yeah, exactly. And so that, that's one thing that's sort of baked into the decision threshold for how large of a shift corresponds to what we call a response. Um, and it's it's certainly true that different cell types will affect what that decision uh, threshold might look like, uh, but also different drug mechanisms would affect that as well. So some drugs might induce a smaller shift than other very cytotoxic drugs that essentially blow up cells when they're working. Um, so it's as of now, we don't take a cell type and drug specific approach to it. We have sort of one fixed threshold that we're using, and this is pro primarily for the sake of gathering validation data. So we can use that threshold and see how well we're performing for calling response and non-response. 
Uh, the idea long term is that as we have larger cohorts of drug and cell type specific data sets, we can start to refine those thresholds and see if there's more meaningful ones that can be used for single drug basis or single tumor type basis. What, what I was starting to wonder, and I, I mean, the heterogeneity is a little bit of a problem for this, but um, if you have a drug, if you have a heterogeneous sample, heterogeneous relative to cancer, so you have, you know, two different, three different cancer sets, genetic or epigenetic, sort of sitting in the same well, you might well have two or three peaks uh, where the drug is working on some of those cells, partly working on some of those cells and not working on other of those cells. And I don't know what the statistics are for that, but you know that would be very, very interesting if you started to get some differentiated peaks and could somehow analyze that. You might have this drug is useful but only for some percentage of the cells. And that other drug is useful for some other percentage of the cells. It might lead a clinician to want to prescribe a combination therapy or something. Yeah, I think that is absolutely a, a really interesting use case. It's actually a, a part of the publication I mentioned earlier, uh, dove into some of the mechanism parsing. So for different drug mechanisms, like you said, there will be different mass peaks that shift in different directions based on the drug mechanism. Um, and you can use that to sort of back out a signature of what's happening with the cells. Um, as of now, for the clinical test, we're really just looking at a distance. So whether or not there is some change that was induced. Oh, yeah, here's the slide that shows the, the different types of drug mechanism effects we might see. So when cells get locked up in, in late cell cycle, they actually become bigger. So you'll see that mass shift to the, to the larger end of the fraction. Um, so you can start to have these sort of fingerprints for different drug mechanisms. And then, like you said, for different subclones within a population of cells, that's something we may also be able to, to parse. Uh, it's not something we really return data on because we don't exactly know how to interpret it. It's more just a, a general readout of response and no response right now. But I think you're absolutely right that there's there's quite a bit of richness to that data when you start thinking about the clonality in those populations. And I mean, you I, could see- I the, love it. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, you could see, you could theoretically see, you know, one of these slides in one well. You could have two or three peaks in one well and you could gather that you're seeing one thing there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I always love this slide just because I, I think it just shows how incredibly sensitive this assay really is. It, uh, it's, it's. I've always thought this was really cool. Um, and, and my final, very quick question, if I might, and if if I've overstayed my welcome, that's fine. Um, you're fine. Go ahead. One quick question: uh, If I mean, I assume that the reason you work on different cancer types is you've isolated, you know, signatures to pull out different types of cancers, you know, APCAM or whatever kind of markers you use. If if for some reason a patient had a belief that there was a certain marker that would distinguish something on their cancer cells and they wanted you to use that as part of the sample prep, would you be willing and able to sort of pull out cells using that marker? I think it's primarily a constraint of our CLIA certification. So our, our protocols uh, are, are fairly stringent right. in terms of how we have to validate. Um, if it goes right. through a sort of a research avenue, it's something we're happy to do. Um, it's just our, our CLIA SOPs are pretty constrained in terms of what we can do. Thank you. That's yeah, great. I will, great stuff. I will point out we we have worked with uh, organizations that help uh, direct uh, patients to really research tools to look at their cancers. And those have all gone through research avenues for you know, processing these samples in ways that are not, you know, purely in our CLIA pipeline. Uh, and so there are resources yeah. like that that we can connect people to. Great. I'm going to uh, jump in here. We're, we're just a little bit after the top of the hour. Um, uh, Dennis and Rob um, uh, and um, and Mark, if you, can you guys stay on just a little bit longer? There are still just a couple of questions that are are on. I'll stop the recording now, but if anyone can stay, um, uh, please let me know. Can you guys yeah, stay on? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, great. I'll stop the recording right now. <laughs>